thank you, Joanne, and welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, for popping along to uh, what is now episode two um, of Coffee and Contract Express. Joanne and I are delighted to uh, to host again this morning. Um, so welcome. Um, just a tiny bit of housekeeping. We we uh, had some logistical issues after the last session uh, in being able to share the video. Uh, of a, a, a recording of that because it had um, some people have had their cameras on. I can't see that everyone, anybody's got their cameras on this morning. Everyone's not not quite brave ahead of a, of a bank holiday weekend. Uh, so thank you for uh, for that for that little piece of housekeeping. Um, just a very briefly intro before we uh, we get started with the, the, the main event. I really wanted to. We'd mentioned last time, you know, the, the, the community and, and trying to keep this, you know, pretty informal. So we're, we're going to keep that for the time being. But I thought the the escapism um, that certainly I and I know potentially others are craving, um, having been in you know, six or seven weeks worth of home working now, um, and uh, I'm still keeping the uh, the Ecuadorian lake on on coffee and contract express this morning. Um, but what I quite liked as well is um, the sessions that we've got. Um, coming on here. We're still working, but we've got a special guest this week. We've got uh, we've got Anna Turner joining us, um, which is great. And Anna has been invited along because in the uh, the first episode, we had a lot of positive feedback. Um, there was a lot of comments around how we could maybe make the sessions a bit more interactive and potentially look at extending the duration for some of the sessions. So Joan and I are avidly exploring that and uh, watch this space and, and certainly feedback anything that you hear from today's session. But realistically, your feedback from the first uh, episode a few weeks ago led to the creation of this one um, around uh, document best practice and governance. And we're delighted that Anna Turner's joined us this morning. Uh, Anna's the director of the software solutions team and uh, basically the all-round contract express guru with, uh, within the team. So we're really pleased to, uh, to have her in there. Joanne's going to quiz her and, and run through some useful insights and questions uh, during the remaining part of this session. Um, and uh, I'll hand over to Joanne just to kind of take over from there. Thanks, Bruce. And uh, welcome to Coffee and Contract Express, Anna. We're pleased to have you uh, join us today. Um, as Bruce mentioned, we're going to talk a bit about uh, best practice and governance and, and what more we could be doing to improve that. Um, and going forward, we're going to try and make these sessions a bit more interactive. So if you do have any questions, then please um, jot them down and save those for the questionnaire that I'll be sending out after this session. Um, and we would really welcome your feedback um, again on, on how we can improve these going forward. So, Anna, hello, how are you? Anna? We can't. Sorry, I no. cut. Can you hear me? Sorry, yes. I cut out slightly. Apologies. No worries. How are you? Uh, yeah, not too bad. You guys changed your pictures. It makes me look like I'm living the high life and uh, you two are hard at work. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, that's, uh, uh, apologies. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's me. It was just, yeah, of course, uh, you know, we're working very hard and Anna's sunning herself in Marrakesh. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was good. Any, anyway, good to see you, Anna. Hope you're well. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Great. So, Anna, where should we start? So, when we when we're talking to our customers, they're really keen to learn more about how how they should organise their automation and how they should manage change requests as well. Um, so can you share a bit of insight on on your recommendations, please? Um, yeah, sure. So um, hi, everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here. Thank you to Joanne and Bruce for inviting me on. Um, so, yes, automation and change requests. Um, I think it's probably better to split those into two um, related but separate categories. So if I start with um, automation requests, you know, starting from scratch, um, I think the real the real point here that I think is a common um, uh, a common starting point and perhaps a common struggle that everyone faces is uh, collecting the information needed. Um, so it might be, um, and of course there are different situations, it might be that you have uh, the PSLs or you know the fee owners themselves doing the automation, in which case in their particular practice area that kind of solves its own problem. Um, however, if you're talking about a centralised automation team or someone who's not familiar with that particular area of law, um, particularly for um, 
you know, perhaps more complex documents, then um, that point of uh, clearly collecting that uh, information uh, needed for the automation is is really key. So the way that we do this, and I'm sure a few people have seen this um, flying around at some point, um, is uh, an automation brief that we ask uh, customers to provide. Um, and so what we're trying to do with that is um, as simply as possible, uh, get the information that we need from the document owner um, into a format that um, someone who may not be legally trained at all, um, but has the automation skills, uh, can apply the automation. So there's two key parts to that. There's the questionnaire itself, um, and there is the markup of the document. Um, and so what we did, and again, this document hasn't really changed for a few years because um, we have found that this is one of the most relatable ways for uh, particularly lawyers to provide this information. Um, is ask the um, ask the document owners to mark up the document with uh, comments, uh, indicating what sections should change in what um, in what circumstances, and then also just give an idea as to what the questionnaire should look like. So, what questions need to be asked in order for this document to be drafted? Um, and so, there are various variations on this theme, but um, th this is the methodology that we use um, with the. Uh, with collecting that information. Now, um, I am aware that there are occasionally time issues um, with this. So, you know, with, you're dealing with uh, very busy lawyers. It might not always be that the particular um, subject matter expert has the has the time to to fill these out. So, there's a couple of a couple of ways that um, uh, that my team are, are flexible with this. Um, and also suggestions for um, for you know slightly alternative variations on a theme, if you like. So one of them is to first of all make use of the functionality available. Um, so slightly different topic, and I'll talk more about this um, a bit later on. But one of the uh, points that we um, quite often go through in the in the author training or you know various refresher sessions going forward is the idea of a of a common dictionary. So theoretically, and again, there's always exceptions. So just you know, take take everything um, I'm saying with with that in mind. There's always special cases, but overall, um, let's say per practice area, for example, um, there um, is usually a fairly common set of questions that will need to be answered, uh, that will need to be asked or answered or used in documents within that practice area in some way. Um, and so um, what we have done in the past in these sorts of situations to try and alleviate this um, this time sink on creating the automation brief from scratch is uh, take some of those um, uh, take some of those uh, key questions, if you like, and produce um, a, a first draft for the document owner in question. Give them an overview in an understandable format. Again, recognizing that perhaps. Um, the, the subject matter specialist might not be overly familiar with automation or indeed might be completely new to it. So providing them um, in a, providing them that information in a format that is understandable. So a Word document printout of the questionnaire as it stands and um, and printouts of the uh, of the documents and the various variations. Um, so that uh, and then we and then we work from there. We work directly with uh, the subject matter experts to build on any additional information that's needed. So it's a, a variation on the automation brief, but it's kind of a jump start, if you like. Um, and again, it's making use of the existing functionality that's within uh, the author tool. So um, the automation should be fairly familiar with how to how to produce those and then take that um, take that on going forward. Um, the other thing um, that we have done in the past and a slightly different approach to this is to um, empower um, certain PSLs and, um, you know, subject matter experts um, who have the ability to, you know, edit and, and maintain these documents in a kind of light touch automation. So um, we have gone through and done a kind of author training light um, for, for certain customers in the past. Um, and the idea with this really is to, um, especially for dealing with a centralized automation team who might be under pressure from, you know, pipeline, new requests, change requests, that sort of thing. This kind of covers two two areas um, in uh, in dealing with the uh, pipeline um, pressures, but also in um, 
in giving uh, the the PSLs a bit more exposure into what's going on on the on the back end. Um, and so the idea with this is that they are um, given this introduction to author. We don't take them through anything like multi-level repeats or anything like that. We take them through a very light touch author so that they are able to um, understand the markup. First of all, um, if you understand how something works, even at a basic level, it's much, much easier to either produce the information needed to begin with or indeed uh, make changes, um, which I'll come on to in a second. But um, the but the idea with this is that, like I said, it empowers um, those subject matter experts to directly either amend um, parts of the template that need amending, or if there's a content change, for example, then it takes pressure off that centralized automation team in making those changes. Um, so there's a few different ways of, of going about this, um, and it very much depends on um, you know, the circumstances within uh, the firm, what the structure is, how people work, Again, like I said, there's there's always there's always um, you know specific considerations, um, but those are I I would say the the general uh, kind of bullet points um, that spring to mind, um, and then with um, yeah again change requests I've I've kind of covered um, already those those sorts of options and you know either using the technology to jumpstart that process if you are running along the automation brief side. Um, making use of the technology in the author tool um, or um, handing over that power to the FIANAs or the PSLs or the subject matter experts who are working on those documents. Um, I also think that it's um, uh, along, the, along the lines of uh, making use of the uh, automation um, and in terms of organising that pipeline, yeah. um, there there are a few different approaches to this um and especially when you're starting up a new automation project it can um seem a little bit overwhelming but again um you could you could organize this just using contract express um i know that many firms have other systems they use to organize this this these sorts of projects um but if you don't have that available to you for for whatever reason then you could use um the functionality available within contract express itself to organize that so um, that's a really interesting one, Anna, and something we could in explore in more detail, uh, maybe on another call as well, around how using the author tool to to take in, um, take use the questionnaire functionality to take in the work as well, to, for that to come into the team and manage that that pipeline, as you say. Sure. That was that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, and on the subject of flat presidents, so just thinking about those because few customers ask around how how should we manage our flat presidents and how does the firm deal with this do you have some insights that you could share on that as well please um yes so um again there's a couple of points to think about with these um one of them that i would just call out is um i mean first first of all uh, how you want to approach your presentation of the automation to your users, how strict of an approach you're taking. Um, but it also does depend on practical considerations such as license numbers. Um, you know, if you're dealing with, uh, you know, an unlimited number of licenses then you can you can really have more flexibility in terms of um, how you approach this particular question. If you're dealing with a limited number of users, then you might want to think about approaching that in a, in a different way. So um, I would say I don't want to describe it as the traditional route, but a route that I have seen um, as, a, as a common access method to, uh, to Contract Express, to particular questionnaires especially, is um, through the flat precedence itself. So, uh, you know, firms will have a flat precedent uh, storage library that, uh, that the, the lawyers will go in and access. And so it, they will be in that flat precedent Word document. Um, and obviously there's the drafting notes that accompany that, you know, the legal notes. Um, but then also embedding a hyperlink from that Word document that takes you to an automated version gives the lawyers a kind of immediate choice. So they can either continue with the flat precedent if it's something specific or they just, you know, they just need to look something up or whatever it is. Um, but if it is, um, uh, but if it is something that would benefit from uh, running through the automated version, then the hyperlink is right there within the flat precedent. Um, now, that obviously does raise the question of um, uh, maintenance. Um, if you have a flat and an automated version, that does double up on the uh, on the maintenance side. Um, unfortunately, no one um, has yet invented an automatic way of duplicating documents and uh, updating those um, without the automation. Um, 
but um, that I would say is a fairly straightforward way and an easy way for uh, that lawyers will recognise to uh, to present them with a choice uh, between the flat and the automated version. Um, the other method um, that we can uh, that we could look into is um, using the automation itself to produce a flat precedent. And so you can go really in depth in terms of the specific automation applied um, using default values, uh, functions like known, known true, that sort of thing. So you can target it at a very specific level within the template itself. Um, obviously, that takes more time on the uh, on the author side, but that does ensure that you have a very um, specific and well controlled flat if you um, uh, if you structure it in that way. The users will still go to the questionnaire, but they can then download that flat precedent as if it was the actual flat and hadn't been automated. Um, I'm not saying you need to go down to that level. Um, there are a lot of profile settings um, within the site's um, admin section and the author section itself uh, that can be used to contribute towards this and take some of that burden off of the automation team. Um, so things like setting uh, default brackets, for example, was a really easy one. Um, but you can also set, um, you know, custom parameters within the profiles if you want to. Um, I have an example where I've got an XML schema, um, a Word XML schema that formats the brackets in a specific way if no questions are answered. Um, and um, I think that highlights it yellow, actually. So it's um, it was quite an exact requirement, um, but there's a lot that you can do with the profiles. So I would also say, you know, don't um, don't think that if you're producing a flat precedent um, using the automation in this way, you're just dealing with the template and you need to have a flat and an automated version. You don't necessarily have to go through and automate every single thing with a known, not known, etc. Um, look into some of the profile settings as well, because I think that um, oftentimes they get overlooked and I'm aware that there are a lot of settings in there, um, but um, the, the profiles are, are very, very handy for, um, for helping deal with this. And that gives you um, one copy uh, of the automated template, reduces the maintenance burden um, and uh, yeah, it gives you the option to produce flat precedents. Great. Thank you, Anna. That, that's really insightful. Thank you. Um, just I know we're running out of time now, but just wondered if there's any more um, overall automation best practice that you have been looking at um, that you can share with us. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, God, that has gone quick, hasn't it? Um, so overall automation best practice, um, I think. Um, Really, the key points that I would that I would cover here, and I'm sorry, I'm going to try and go as, as quickly through these as possible. Um, I mean, template organization is an obvious one, um, particularly when you are starting out a project or perhaps rolling out into a new practice area. Um, really having an idea as to uh, what the documents are and what the requirements are, but also down to um, the, the more the little things that actually make a big difference. Um, and it often is things like, uh, you know, the, the shared common dictionaries that I was talking about that we uh, that we go through in the um, the author training um, that will that will have a time saving benefit um, if you apply that as a process throughout your your automation rollout. Um, so often those little things have a big impact on the project. So uh, shared dictionaries for one, um, looking into the concept of clause libraries, again, um, that we go through in the author training to begin with. Um, and even if these are not things that are implemented right away, especially when you're starting from scratch with automation, it can be um, overwhelming or difficult to kind of take all these considerations in, when, especially if you're learning automation as well. Um, but um, I would also say another key point to remember is that a lot of these processes can be added in. Um, it, they're good to um, consider and bear in mind when you're starting with automation or you're rolling out to a new practice area. But I think that people feel a lot of pressure to have these implemented right away or they can't do them at all. Um, and so I think having that that kind of phased approach um, to the automation rollout is something just to bear in mind, to take the pressure off of the automation teams and the, and the, the management of the automation teams as well. Um, the other thing that I would say is, again, um, 
Clarity is really key, uh, regardless of what sort of area we're talking about. So um, making use of the test environment, we provide test environments regardless of the um, of the deployment type. Um, obviously, there's some additional setup with some deployments, but um, as as a best practice, we have a production and a development side. I know that some some uh, customers have more than that, but prod and dev. Um, so again, making making best use of those test environments, uh, making sure that you have a clear process for the testing of the templates, that your authors understand that, um, and that your users are using the production site. Uh, you're keeping that data separate because it also affects things like reporting um, and um, you know testing templates on a production site. It's probably not the best idea because you don't want to be interfering with any content that is already in production. Um, and like I said, again, it can uh, impact other um, other things, um, such as the reporting that's already on the production site. So again, clarity with um, with the setup of the environments um, is also a good one. Um, and also clarity with uh, the testing process itself, um, even if that is the document owners, so not necessarily the automation team itself. Um, we have lots of um, kind of tips and tricks for specific users. Um, when testing. So tips for authors, for example, who are, you know, more au fait with the system itself, but then also tips for, um, you know, the document owners who may not have that level of knowledge on on the system or, or the automation process itself. Um, so um, investing a bit of time with that testing process, I think, is a real is a real benefit. Um, and it does cut down on, you know, the number of iterations with the uh, with the template development. Um, and yes, um, making making use of the functionality as well. Um, you know, looking at what you are going to get the most benefit out of. Um, you know, if it's the integrations or, um, like I said, some of the document automation um, uh, strategies that we can employ, like the common dictionaries. You know, whether it's working with suites, um, the the flat precedents um, that we that we talked about. Um, so just. Um, seeing what your requirements are and making best use of uh, what is available through the functionality. Um, and of course, um, asking us if there are any questions because we are we are here to help. So, um, Absolutely. yeah, if um, and it, it's not just, you know, how how do how do I do this? Um, you know, straightforward questions. Um, if there, there are additional questions on on these sorts of topics, um, then that that is exactly what we're here for um, with the Contract Express team. And there we are. Thank you. And, and you've travelled. Updating the slides. Um, so thank you, Anna. That was fantastic. And uh, we'll certainly need you to come back on and, and talk about the other areas that we didn't quite get to cover. Um, and if, if anyone has any questions, then please um, add them to the questionnaire that I'll be sending out shortly and we can fire those across to Anna and we can always invite her back on as well uh, and going forward we'll make them a bit more interactive and Bruce are you going to um, share the the right slides this time? And tell us, yeah tell sure that's uh, <laughs> that's my, my fault with having about six versions of slide deck so uh, uh, apologies but uh, just very quickly to, to recap thank you very much Joanne for uh, for, for chairing that session and uh, obviously uh, very, very big thanks to Anna to, to giving some insights. We will collate the questions. All questions that come back, we'll uh, we'll share with everyone uh, because again, we're, again, trying to harbour that that community, um, so that there may be questions that you've thought of uh, that when we answer, it triggers off some other things. And as we say, Joan and I are continuing to explore for episode three. Uh, what that will look like in terms of interaction questions and, and longevity as well, because we've overrun on this session, uh, which uh, I suppose was inevitable with, with such a large volume of expertise to be able to uh, to tap into. Um, but just harping back to the very beginning about the escapism, uh, all at home, all in our gardens, all in our neighbourhoods, um, and just thought we'd share some some travel pictures. Uh, Joanne, uh, in the the vineyards of uh, of southern France around um, uh, in the summer, looking looking actually delightful out there. Um, me last year uh, with family in the Grand Canyon, which was a fantastic experience. And uh, Anna off to some lunch in Marrakesh, as I said earlier. So um, thank you all very much for attending. Uh, recording will be made available if you'd like to share further or, or, or listen again 
uh, to some of the feedback and uh, discussion points that were raised today. And as I say, please do complete the questionnaire that Joanne sends through, as that really helps guide uh, what the next session will look like. Um, thanks very much. Have a great long weekend. Uh, today is Friday, um, so uh, speak to you all soon. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you.